the big question everyone is asking after the recent South California earthquakes, could the massive South California earthquakes trigger the big one on the San Andreas Fault? Well, live science, which is of course NASA and uh, NOAA site, which is of course for our benefit, Tia Goose and Gianna Brunner report what they have found, the twin quakes that we've had near Ridgecrest on a, basically an unknown fault to us laymen who are not geologists, the Garlock Fault, which recently geologists have found is interlocked and zipped closed tight with the San Andreas Fault. We've seen in the previous videos how the earthquake of 6.2 that took place north of Vancouver Island off Canada's coast on July 3rd, 13 hours later we had the July 4th 6.4 in Ridgecrest. But that's not the first time that happened. Five years ago that same exact thing happened. Again in July it was a 6.2 magnitude off the, uh, the north coast of uh, Vancouver Island and at that time it was 24 hours later that they had an earthquake at Ridgecrest. But it wasn't anywhere near 5, it was something like 3.5 magnitude. The thing is though that we see that that quake, the quakes north of Vancouver Island, somehow that pressure that frequency comes down and travels along San Andreas, turns 90 degrees and hits towards the end of the Garlock Fault at Ridgecrest. So why is that? Well, some scientists say that it's because San Andreas is locked tight like a zipper with the Garlock Fault. At one point they said they thought that the Garlock Fault would cut that at that position of um, where Garlock meets uh, San Andreas around Los Angeles and you can very easily see it on Google Earth those faults 90 degrees at each other they thought at one time that Garlock would cut through and stop the, free, the um, um, activity of San Andreas at that point but that never happened because they're, they end up locked now, if they unzip, that's something else. But at the meantime, in the meantime, they're zipped, and it looks like the frequency, the pressure, uh, just went off on a tangent and um, hit the Ridgecrest area. Now, we've had over. Uh, I'll show you later when I get into it. But I want to because I want to get into the live science explanation of what's going on with the big one. But uh, we've already in the past 24 hours have the recorded quakes in the area of 1,406. That's not counting all the other countries or Midwest United States which had two quakes today or 35 that we had in Iran, <laughs> the Iran area. No, I wouldn't say Iran. That's no, that, oh no, that's not Iran. I see that's in the Mediterranean. No, 13, yeah, 13 in Iran. Uh, we, I did a video earlier on that having to do with the fact that it's near the nuclear power plants, two nuclear power plants and a nuclear facility. It's like a triangle and the, of, those, of those facilities and the um, earthquakes are in the middle of them. Uh, and those, uh, that area is on a subduction zone that has given tsunamis in the um, Persian Gulf as well in the past. But that's, you can see the video, a couple of videos back on that. But in the meantime, we've had uh, 1,406 quakes uh, in that area. Now, let's look at uh, what live science has to say concerning this. The twin quakes, the biggest to hit South California in over 25 years. They rattled 
the stretch of the Mojave Desert on Thursday, July 4th and Friday, July 5th, sending seismic waves rippling through the earth that could be felt from Los Angeles to San Jose. Thankfully, there were no casualties. Thank goodness. I think it was because of the fact that on July 4th, they had the, we had, when we had the 6.4 earthquake, that sort of uh, prepared everybody to be ready because the geologists immediately came out and said we could have uh, the same magnitude or even greater quakes. And thankfully, this quake of the 7.1 was at 8.19 uh, in the evening. People were probably just after dinner. They, were, they weren't yet in their beds asleep. So uh, it was a time of uh, the evening when people were up and about and still active. So they were uh, ready to sort of sprint out of the house if need be. And thank goodness we didn't have any casualties. Now, it hit also in a very sparsely populated area of uh, California in Ridgecrest. The ruptured faults were not part of the San Andreas Fault System which snakes 800 miles, or 1,287 kilometers from north to south along the coastline, the west coast, where the North American plate and the Pacific plates, plates meet. But there's a chance that these quakes, according to the geologists, could somehow transfer stress to the San Andreas Fault, potentially triggering the much feared big one in one of the state's most populated cities. Is that so? Is there a chance? That's the question. Now, it, if it is theoretically possible, though there's no known link between the two fault systems, geophysicists say. And because there's still so much to learn about the complicated fault system that ruptured, it's difficult to say whether the San Andreas Fault took on additional stress from the recent quakes, they say. Okay, all right. We had other geologists that say they have uh, found that they're zippered together. Uh, other geologists say they're, they have nothing to do with each other. You see that there is some kind of a conflicting opinion here. There are hidden faults in the area. The magnitude 7.1 quake on July 5th ruptured a known portion of the Little Lake Fault Zone. The Little Lake Fault Zone. While the magnitude 6.4 quake that hit the day before ruptured a previously unmapped region of the fault zone. Glenn Biassi, a geophysicist of the USGS in Pasadena, California, told Live Science in an email, if you look at the map of the faults, you'd see that the Little Lake Fault Zone and the San Andreas Fault Zone are not very close together. We do not know if a definite relationship of these earthquakes to the San Andreas exists, Biassi said. That said, geologists are still learning a lot about the Little Lake Fault Zone. Many of the individual faults in the zone are active, quote, and because they are buried, we probably do not know them all. This area does not fit the textbook picture of sides of a plate sliding past one another, end quote, explained Biazzi. And because these faults are so complicated and we know relatively little about them, it's hard to say how they will interact with the San Andreas. It is possible that the recent quakes added stress to the San Andreas Fault, though, quote, we don't have a good way to assess the likelihood, end quote, said Michelle Cook, a geologist at the University of Man Massachusetts in Amherst. So they don't have the way of, uh, of assessing how these faults can be interrelated with each other. Quote, the San Andreas has not slipped in a long while. If the fault is loaded to the point where it is just about ready to slip, then it is possible that the recent earthquake could add just enough shear stress to the San Andreas to cause it to slip. Alternatively, the slip of these recent earthquakes could unclap the San Andreas fault, making it easier to slip, unquote, Cook said on Life Science in an email. So there you go. It's either got the um, stress to uh, cause a slip, or it's uh, unclamped, unlocked, unzipped to make it easier to slip. Either way, uh, uh, either way, one or the other, 
it could be easier for the uh, a mega quake to occur in the San Andreas. Now, what about mid mi the migrating stress? The migrating stress. Another intriguing possibility is that there is a bigger shakeup underground that these recent earthquakes are unmasking. Some of the movement on the San Andreas Fault is migrating east. Okay, there we go. That's what we were saying in the beginning. That's according to what the, the geologists recently found concerning the fact that the garlock is zipped with the San Andreas at that connection that they have with each other at the west. And uh, we saw that the pressure and the quakes happened at the east side of the Garlock Fault, pointing towards uh, Las Vegas. Las Vegas. So they said, OK, some of the movement on the San Andreas Fault is migrating east, crossing the Mojave Desert, and heading up the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, Biasi said. Three big ruptures including one in 1992 and 1999, and the recent ridgecrest quakes all seem to be aligned and are part of what's known as the Eastern California Shear Zone, ECSZ for short, Eastern California Shear Zone, Cook said. By contrast, the southern portion of the San Andreas Fault has not had a major rupture in 150 years, she said. Some suggest that we are seeing a migration of the active plate boundary away from the San Andreas Fault, Cook said. I'm not yet convinced of this, but I do think that, it's recent, that this recent, geogra geologically speaking, cluster of earthquakes in the Eastern California shear zone, the ECSZ, is very interesting. Yes, of course it's interesting. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media, and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Capota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.